we had a church-wide lunch, and people brought their favorite desserts and favorite drinks, and, and um, we supplied a lot of the food, provided the food. And the cool thing about that was is there was a church-wide support of this building because we knew that this space was not just meant to hold warehouse community and its church service, but this space was a place that existed to serve our community. And we wanted to do multiple things that weekend and show people that what this building was actually for. So we do celebrate this building today as it, as it being our first Saturday in this space, and we are just so thrilled to finally be here. There was a lot of blood, sweat, and tears, um, and it's still a work in progress, but we are happy. We were glad that we were able to use the Schmidt for the last two years, but man, it just feels different to be in your own space. So we are thrilled and, and we're happy, and, and as we are uh, beginning something new, we're actually ending something else. If you've been journeying with us, you know that at the end of 2020, we talked about a new series that we were going to be going into, and that was, what is church? And for a year, we answered that question, and then we talked about a church in action. And today, it, all of that pretty much comes to a culmination, and we, and we close it out. So we're going to look back on a few things that we discussed, that we, we talked about, and we're going to end that series and go into a new one that uh, later you're going to hear a little bit more about. But have you ever listened to a song, or maybe you've, you've tasted something, or, or you, have, you have gone to a certain place that you haven't been to in a long time, or maybe you... you you smelled something that brought you back to a moment in your past, a good moment, a moment where you're like, oh, man, I, I, I remember this certain experience in my life. Or, or maybe it's something that reminds you of somebody significant in your life. There are certain things that we experience that bring us a memory of the past, something that, man, I wish I could just go back to that moment. There are two things that remind me of my grandmother. She passed away, but she was someone who moved from Texas to, to care for me, to care for my sister, and, and, and she was essentially my babysitter throughout the day so that my parents could work. And there are two things that every time I, I smell or taste these things, I think of mama, my grandmother. One of them is coffee. I used to hate the smell of coffee. If you know me, you know things have changed. But my grandmother, no matter what time of day, morning, lunch, late at night, she was brewing coffee, and I thought it smelled disgusting. And I remember she would drink it all the time. And, and now when I smell that coffee, I remember of her just always wanting to have her cup of coffee. The second thing is something that she would make me every morning, and the closest thing that I can equate to it in English is cream of wheat. And she would make me a, a, an adult, a man-sized portion of cream of wheat, and I would devour that thing every single morning. And now when my, when my wife makes it for our children, um, she's figured out the secret recipe and, and what you need to put in it to make it taste amazing. But every time she makes it, I'll sneak in and I'll put my finger in there and eat it because it just tastes so good. It reminds me of my childhood. It reminds me of the moments with my grandmother. There are certain things that remind you of the past. And, and a lot of these memories, and maybe you drive through a certain part of town or you visit a location that maybe brings back a negative feeling or a, a, a moment of sadness because you remember something. This past week, as I reflected on this two-year journey of answering the question, what is church, and a church in action, I looked back at some old texts and sermons, and I began to recall and, and remember the memories that were made because of, of what God had put in our hearts to preach on, and, and what we challenged all of you to do, and all of you would respond in a way, and you'd visit with us, and you'd talk to us about what we discussed on really talking about what it means to exist as the body of Christ, as the church. And I, I, I can recall the things that we prayed for. We prayed for a restoration of marriages. 
We prayed for broken homes. We prayed for healing. We prayed for miracles. We prayed for friendships to be restored. We prayed for jobs. We prayed for kids going off to college. And there are many of you that are back. And a lot of you in 2019 were just starting college. And now you're ending your time in college. And so you've been gone through this whole time of waiting. But we prayed for you. Because that's what a church does. They do life together. We share in our vulnerability. We walk alongside each other. We share in our sorrows. And we celebrate in our joys. All of that... What we preach from that pulpit, we were in a borrowed space. And I believe that we're still going to do those things and God is still going to show up in this space. I believe that just because we moved from one location to another, that doesn't mean God changes. He's still going to show up. And, and even though we were anticipating this space, God still did what he had to do. We call ourselves warehouse community and people wonder, why are you guys call yourselves warehouse community when you're not even in a warehouse? It's like, well... One day. And we pushed the deadline back and we kept saying dates and finally we just stopped saying when we believed we were going to be in this place. And even though we were in a season of waiting, God was not. God was still moving because we didn't need a building for God to do what he does. We didn't need a space to have church. We could be in a borrowed space. We could be outside and we learn that in the beginning of Acts that people met in the homes outside of temples, in temples, because they knew that the movement, the church, was the body. The people made up the church. We may not need this building, but we needed the people in it. And God gave us that hope that we have today. We learned that the church in the beginning of Acts, it moved very, very Quickly, the early church was on fire for Jesus. And in the beginning of Acts, we see what happened when people came together and they prayed with anticipation and hope. It said the Holy Spirit moved and there was, it moved like fire. The church was on fire for Jesus. People gave up of their needs for the sake of others. It, it told us when people were in need... They, gave, they came together and they gave what they had so that people could have whatever it is that they needed. They were sacrificial in their life. They knew what it meant to follow Jesus. Jesus had now left and he had handed over the responsibility to humans, to mankind, to then carry the message of the gospel throughout time. And here we are now still talking about the goodness of Jesus the church, they met in homes, they met outside, they met in the temple courts. The church was meant to do life together. This meant having fun together. We didn't have warehouse last week because we were at our church retreat, a yearly gathering that we go out into the middle of nowhere, Alachua Springs, if you don't know where that is, Camp Kalakwa, and we just retreat. We, we, uh, we do some pretty wild things that we weren't supposed to do. I didn't, but there were some who decided to go swim in the springs with the alligators at midnight. But we ate together. We worshiped together. We played together. A lot of you went down tubing down the river for two hours together. We had fun because that's what church does, but we also journey together in our sorrow and in our pain. We can't have church without both of those things. The church thrives when we are vulnerable, when we share with one another, when we ask the difficult questions with, with one another. How's your heart? How can I pray for you? What's going on? Is your marriage healthy? Are your friendships healthy? How is your walk with God? Are we asking those questions? Because if we're not, we're not the church. We share in our struggles and we join together in our celebrations. This is why the church Exist. The church was meant to share the gospel and do it proudly, unashamed within the community that we exist in. We saw Paul and other leaders, they, 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 we, we read about how they went from city to city planting churches and, and they were building up and, and they were finding leaders because that's what they were called to do. That's what, what, what Jesus left them with. 
He said, go and plant and, and share the gospel. And they journeyed along, and, and we saw how they went from place to place. And at the very end, they went backwards. And they went back to check on these communities to see how healthy they were and how if the leaders were thriving, if they had done a good job, if they had fulfilled their calling in Jesus. There was no marketing scheme. There was no social media. There wasn't much of that to get word out. It was just word of mouth and walking from city to city telling people about Jesus. There was nothing fancy about it. And still the church grew and exploded because of what Jesus had done on that cross. I believe that that is our calling as a church, as Forest Lake Church, as Warehouse Community. The church was called to be courageous and to fulfill its purpose regardless of any hurdle, regardless of any downfall. Whatever happens outside of us, we still have our mission. Regardless of to the point of, of facing persecution, that is what we are called to when we, when we commit to a life with Christ. Each of us has a specific calling within the body, and we are challenged to find it. And we did that the last two years. We journeyed, personally, I journeyed. I journeyed with some of you, figuring out what God has called you to do within the body of Christ. And I believe all of this will continue to happen because God is not done with us. But when he is, when he is finished... When it's all said and done, my prayer is that we have, as a community can hear those words, it is done. That is my prayer for a warehouse community, for Forest Lake Church. What is church? Why do we exist? We exist for this very moment to hear those words, it is done. It's our aim. It's our goal. It's what we, we shoot for. It's what we, what we strive for. And it's what we, we, we long for each and every day, to hear those words, it is done. Book of Revelation, John writes this letter to the seven churches. And if you've read the New Testament, you're familiar with letters being, being written for specific communities, the churches that were created to either congratulate, to discipline, to educate. And here we see another letter, a prophetic letter. Essentially, this is written to do three things, to encourage them to remain faithful, to resist sin, and to anticipate the coming of Jesus. That is why these letters were written. Essentially, the word that comes to mind is to have hope. With the promise that God will make all things new again. What we see in Revelation 21, and if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Revelation. If you don't know where that is, just go to the end. You'll find it. But put simply, Revelation 21, that is our why. Our answer to so much of the pain and despair that we're going through, to the violence, to the hurt, to the poverty... To the brokenness of our own human nature, Revelation 21 is our hope. So the ones asking the question, when will my pain, when will my sorrow, when will the grief end in my life? It just seems like nothing goes right. Revelation 21 is your hope. This isn't the first time we see this language and, and this idea. Scripture starts with this. Genesis 1 through 3 we see of this new heaven and this new earth. It starts and ends with Jesus. To the ones asking the question, how much longer this is your hope? This is why we do what we do. Scripture opens with this idea of a new heaven and a new earth after the fall of man. It ends with the idea and the promise of a new heaven and a new earth. That's to say, if it was true back in the days of Moses, it's true in the days of John, and it will remain true. My promise will never fail. Scripture started with it, it ended with it, and in between, God says, I will create a new heaven and a new earth. I stay true to my word. 
Revelation 21, starting in verse 1, I'll just read you a, a few verses. And then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice on the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear away from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who, he who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of water of life. To those who are victorious will inherit all of this, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. This is your hope. This is our hope. In darkness, when moments where we just can't see light at the end of the tunnel, this is the promise that started scripture and it ended scripture because God has the final say. And we long for the day where we hear the words, it is done. In the meantime, we have work to do. In the meantime, we have people to tell about this promise to give this kind of hope to. A new heaven and a new earth. God isn't going to create that without the eradication of sin. Sin can no longer be in the picture when God creates this new heaven and this new earth. But what about the idea of, of free will and choice? In the beginning, God gave Adam and Eve the ability of choice. They didn't ask to be created, but God, being sovereign and gracious, gave them the choice. And they made their choice. And in the end, when we have our decision, we will have to make a choice. And for that reason, we choose life or death. We choose God or the enemy. And if we choose God, we know that our decision has been made and there will be no sin, no more of the enemy to bring the heartache, the pain, the sorrow, and the heartache that we endure each and every day. We have a choice to make. And I pray that we choose the hope in Jesus. This word, new in Greek, is kainos. And there are, there are multiple words in Greek that actually allude to the word new. But specifically in Revelation, the word Kainos is referencing something being made new that already exists and not needing to be made from origin. God is going to restore this earth, this heaven, and this, this earth. And I love that word because it's the same word used to restore humanity. Already been created, being broken, needing to be made new. In our brokenness, in our hurt, in our sinning against God, he provides us hope because all he wants to do is make us new again. Just like he wants to do this new heaven and this new earth. This is an act of restoration. The new heaven and the new earth mirrors what God did for humanity. He didn't destroy us, but he restored us. That was once beautiful, then broken, now made new all over again. Because of a second chance. The idea of the sea that you read, that the sea being no longer. If you remember, if you look back and maybe you have time, read Revelation 13. The sea is where the enemy, God's enemy came out of. And God said, I'm not even going to have the place where he came out of to exist. The place we existed will no longer come out of. I'm no, not only going to destroy the enemy, but the source of where it came from. Destroying the sea because there is no chance that the enemy will become victorious over God. 
not even giving it a chance. God's dwelling place will be with his people. There will be no more need for a a temple because the literal presence of God is the temple. The literal presence of God being among us is the grace that covers us. In the Old Testament, we know the story of the sanctuary and how, how essential it was because Jesus had not come yet and there was the, the, the prophesying and the promise of a soon Messiah where this would not need to happen. But until then, there was the sanctuary and it would travel with the people and it would be in the middle of their camp and, and only the, the high priest could go into the most holy place for atone for the sins of the people and they would bring a blameless lamb to atone for those sins. And God says, that ended with Jesus, and it ends with me being in your presence. My dwelling place covers your sins. I will dwell. I will be with my people. I will be the sanctuary. I will be the dwelling place. I promise to be with my people. That's what God is longing for, to be our dwelling place. We also see a reference of this in in Ezekiel 37, 27. It says, God's promise to make his dwelling place with his people, he would be their God. And them his people. Meaning that God's presence covers all. God's presence is the place where we find hope. And through God and through the Holy Spirit, today we live and have hope that we will be made new again. This is our why. This is why the church exists. Every group, every person needs a purpose. Now, more than ever, there is so much depression and sadness in our life. Such a huge deal in our world today and in our culture, and there are so many things that contribute to it. But without purpose, we have no meaning. Without purpose, we have no reason to get up Every morning, it doesn't motivate us, and so we fall into a place of lost and confusion and into depression. God says, I want to give you a purpose. I want to give you a reason to live. I want to give you hope. It may not have started with me, but I promise you it can end with me. This is why we do what we do. If we fail to challenge each other to cast vision from this pulpit, from this place, then we will lose our purpose. Humanity was designed to seek after hope. We were designed to have hope in something. And a lot of us may not find it here. We may be looking for it in the wrong places God says, I want to be your hope. I want to give you the future. I want to dwell among you forever. To whisper in your ear, there's no more pain, no more suffering. And to hear the words, it is done. That's why we exist. That's why we have church. We have our hope. That is our aim. That is what we look forward to. Our ability to move towards our purpose started on the cross with three words. It is done. And when he returns, he will say those three words again. It is done. The church starts and ends with Jesus, and he has the final say. He is the authority. He is our purpose. He is our salvation. He is our hope. He is our healer. He is our access to life that promises that we will be made new again. He is everything He will wipe every tear from our eyes. There will be no more death, no more mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. That's the promise. He was the only one in the beginning and will be the only one to finish it. The Alpha and the Omega. The promise that started in Genesis and ends in Revelation, the Alpha and the Omega, that is Jesus, and that is our hope. If Jesus is not the source of your study, you're doing it wrong. 
our focus has been on all the wrong things when we read in Revelation. I've seen it so many times. The math is right, the dates may be correct, and the Greek is spot on, but if Jesus is not the source of your study, you're doing it wrong. I can't tell you how many times as, as a child I would go to church, won't say where, wasn't here, but we'd have evangelists come and talk about Revelation. And if you were grew up in the church, you know what those handouts look like. I'm not going to go into detail. But I remember a specific preacher. I won't say his name. But when I saw him, I feared for my life. I remember the sermons he would preach. They would scare the life out of me. And I remember sitting in the, the church pew, plugging my ears because I did not want to hear all the bad things that he was talking about. Never once do I remember Jesus being preached. I was scared. I was terrified. We were preaching revelation without Jesus. There would be no book of revelation if it wasn't for what Jesus did on that cross. The story of redemption is where we find our hope. You can't preach the book of Revelation without preaching Jesus doesn't make sense. If we need to fear people into following Christ, that means that we really don't believe how good God really is. If we leave Jesus out of the equation, then we really don't believe in the restoration power of Jesus. We feel like we just have to fear people into, into salvation. If we preach revelation without Jesus, we don't believe that his grace is sufficient. Don't get me wrong. There is a place and there is value into understanding and translating and figuring out what this wild book has to say. And there is a time and a place for that. But we have to know what we're doing it for. Who we are doing it for. We have to know Jesus. We talk so much about the second coming when people even haven't heard about the first one. You can't preach the Bible without preaching Jesus. You can't have church without Jesus. You can't be a church in action without the grace and redemptive power of Jesus Christ. This is our why, a new heaven and a new earth. No more pain. Having all of these stresses in our life pass away with the old earth. Imagine what that's going to be like. Think about what you're going through right now. Think about the pain you've endured. Think about the people that you have lost. And think about the promise. Imagine with me the day that he comes and he says, it is done. You don't have to deal with that anymore. I'm here for you. I've never left you. That's why we do what we do. No more pain, no more heartache, no more grief, no more violence. No more hate. Jesus longs for us to hear those words. The same ones that he spoke of on the cross are the ones we want to hear when he returns. It is done. This building, it isn't perfect. Pastor Mark, Pastor, Pastor Justin, and myself, we can point out all the things we don't like about this building. The things that, man, we wish we would have done something different. But I'll tell you one thing, it was made new. And there are flaws, just like us. There are flaws. There are markings on its hands, just like there are on Jesus. But just like this building, it isn't perfect, neither are, are we, but we will be made new again. We, we, we long for this place, for this building to be a place where people can come who are broken, who are hurting, who need community, who need to be loved on. 
who need to know that they're going to be okay, a safe place to come to and to know that these people that come to Warehouse Community will step up for me because they have hope. And there are so many people outside of this building who do not have hope. They need to know about Jesus. What is church? It's telling people about Jesus. It's being an active voice. Letting people know how good he actually is. It's not about numbers. It's not about getting people through the door. It's basically being an extension of the church being an extension of Jesus to let them know that they're going to be okay. May we long for those words, it is done. This is a promise that is only as strong as the person giving it and his ability to do what he or she says. God has remained true to his word from Genesis to Revelation, from beginning to end the end, the Alpha and the Omega, from 2019 to 2023, he remained true. And I'm not going to lie, I doubted. I said, should we even be doing this? Is this even going to be possible? And we're here today, and God's telling me, why did you ever doubt? I'm the same yesterday, I'm the same today, and I will remain the same. I've put this promise on your heart, and I will make it come to reality, and so he did. But until he returns, we know that he lives in us. We know that he has made himself accessible. He has come down from heaven. He walked this earth so that he could remain in us until he comes again. We see the words in the beginning and at the end of scripture. And your life may not have started with Jesus, but I guarantee you it can end with Jesus. And maybe you haven't made that choice to say, God, I give my life to you. I'm broken. I'm in need of saving. I need hope and I need a future. Your story can end with him. You've just got to ask. He's pursuing you. He's chasing you. And this is what the church is for. This is why we exist, to love on each other, to be with one another, and to remind each other that God is that good. May we, may, may we make the prayer about Jesus. May, it, may we say, God, I need you. I accept you. I receive your grace and your mercy, and I desire a life with you one who restored me from my brokenness forever. What is church? It's all about Jesus. It's all about having hope in his return in a new heaven and a new earth. Until then, he says, I dwell among you. I will be with you. Heaven remains in us if we just allow it to. God promises us, promises to be with us through the ups, through the downs, through the the dark moments and in that tension he says I will be with you and I long for the day until I can dwell among you in a place where there will be no more heartache, no more pain no more loss but until then I will remain in you, that is the promise and if he said it back then and he was true with John in the book of Revelation and we live life with experiences knowing where God has showed up, then we know that his promise will never, ever fail. May we have hope in a God who promises to return, to wipe every single piece of darkness and pain from our lives. Until then, my prayer is that God remain in you and that you make that decision to live a life with Christ. May you invite him into your life and say, God, I don't know what the next week, the next month, the next year looks like, but I need you. I have hope that you'll come again. And may this church be a place that shines hope, the hope that we have.
of Jesus Christ. Father God, in these next few moments, Lord, we ask for those who may be struggling, who may have just wandered away from you, gotten lost in bad decisions, in addiction, in debt, in anger, that they can run back to you in this very moment. May heaven live in them. May you live in them until you return. May this be a place. May this be a home of restoration and hope in Jesus. May we live the gospel in warehouse community. God, we know this is just the beginning of what you're going to do in this place. We can't wait for you to show up each and every week. May we pray like the old church, like the beginnings of the church. And may Holy Spirit fire just flood this place where it is just obvious that you are moving. Lord, we can't wait to be with you again. Until then, Lord, may you abide and may you live in us. May your dwelling place be in our hearts and give us the hope. And may we hear those words, it is.